today we have another provocative, uh, wonderful speaker who will uh, stretch our thinking, and that is Don Tapscott, who I am very, very pleased to, in to introduce. His influence in discussions of the global economy have, uh, has gone on for well over 20 years, and he's always been in the midst of what's going to happen. Uh, I, telling us what's at the horizon as opposed to what we can easily see. He's one of the world's authorities on business strategy with an emphasis on how information technology changes business, government, and society. And uh, a lot of you here, well, not that many, but some of you here qualify as the millennials. And that makes you a heck of a lot more technologically savvy than I am. And you'll be changing the world in ways that Don understands uh, very well and has written extensively about. He's almost a school of management in and of himself, providing us with information on how business and technology intersect and how that ultimately has an impact not just on business, but how we live. He's the author of 13 widely read books, including, many of you know, Wikonomics, which was the best selling book in uh, the US in business in 2007, and now is translated into over 30 languages. Uh, you may recognize some of his other books. Paradigm Shift, The New Promise of Information Technology, written in 1992. As I said, he's usually ahead of the curve. Uh, Digital Capital, Harnessing the Power of Business Webs, written in 2000, which describes how business webs are replacing the traditional model of the firm and changing how wealth is created and how competition transpires. Uh, the Naked Corporation, How the Age of Transparency Will Revolutionize Business, written in 2003 co-authored with David Tickle, and describes how corporate transparency, accountability, and stakeholder relationships are the new frontier for competitive innovation. In a sense, he was also the oracle of uh, the meltdown that was occurring without the transparency and accountability that should have been there. Also wrote Enterprise 2.0 in 2008, and his most recent book is Grown Up Digital, How the Net Generation is Changing Your World, which was published late last year, and today will be the topic of our talk, and I'm sure you'll be able to relate to that. Don is chairman of Engineera Insight, for which he directs several of Engineera's, am I pronouncing it right? Engineera. It's N, little n, big G. Uh, insights, uh, research and education programs that he directs, uh, serving a who's who list of global clients. He was the founder and chairman of the international think tank New Paradigm before it was acquired by Engineera. He's also an occasional professor at one of our peer schools, the Rotman School in Toronto. He's a Canadian through and through, holds a BS in psychology and statistics from Trent and an MED from Alberta, has honorary law degrees from University of Alberta and Trent University. We are delighted that Don is with, with us today, and I want to especially thank Sarah Weldon, who's a UCLA alum, who works with Don at Genera and brought those Bruin, that Bruin, Bruin blood to bear in influencing Don in, in coming here. So please welcome Don Tapscott. Uh, well, thanks, Judy, for that too kind introduction. I am delighted to be here. And you do have an extensive alumni network because uh, there were several people from different perspectives who uh, suggested that I should come here today and to speak to you. I started studying children, young people, as a generation about 15 years ago when I noticed how my own children were effortlessly able to use all the sophisticated technology. And at first I thought, my children are prodigies. And, um, but then I noticed that all their friends were like them, and that was a bad theory. So um, I started working with 300 kids back about uh, 15 years ago, and it was a dozen years ago. Digital. Flash forward to today, this generation is not just growing up, they've grown up digital. They're coming into the, they're in the universities. They're coming into the workforce, into society, they're becoming consumers, they're becoming citizens. And I'm convinced that there's no more powerful force to change every institution 
than this intersection of demographics and uh, technology revolution. Exhibit A, they just elected their first president of the United States. Now, and that's just not my, <laughs> that's not only my point of view, it's his point of view. Now, if you uh, read the book, and you'll hear from my lecture today, I'm pretty optimistic about young people and about this generation. I think that overall, digital immersion has been good for them. I am a minority on that particular point of view. If you look at popular media, the books, PBS specials, uh, newspaper articles, and so on, there's a lot of uh, unease, or worse, cynicism about this generation, reflected in this book called The Dumbest Generation. An English professor at Emory College named Mark Berline says, the, the subtitle is How the Digital Age Stupefies Young Americans and Jeopardizes Our Future. He says, don't trust anyone under 30. <laughs> so um, I thought I'd kind of get in the spirit of all the cynicism and put a blog up on the internet just to get a conversation going. So I'll play, play it for you now. Hey, moron, if you're a teenager or in your 20s, you're part of the dumbest generation. And the reason? The internet. Digital immersion is hurting brain development. You're a generation that can't read, write, communicate, and you know nothing. Furthermore, you're net addicted. You're glued to the screen and you're losing your social skills. You're also an overcoddled generation and you mooch off your parents. You steal. You violate intellectual property rights with no consideration of the interests of the owners of music or other content. You're violent and you're a bunch of bullies. You're a generation that doesn't give a damn. You don't vote. You don't care. In fact, you're the narcissistic me generation. All you care about is your MySpace and your YouTube and your Facebook. And because of you, the future is hopeless. Well, my name is Don Tapscott, and I've just conducted the definitive investigation of your generation, a $4 million research project. And I've come to the conclusion that all of these critics of youth today are basically making this stuff up. This negative and cynical view is not supported by data. You're not the dumbest generation, you're the smartest generation. And as you move into every institution in society, you're a powerful force for change, and change for the better. I hope that you find my new book, Grown Up Digital. Okay, so <laughs> here's some mud. <laughs> and I invite you to grownupdigital.com. I'd like to know what you think. OK, apologies for the obligatory ad at the end there. Um, so I'm a researcher. Let me give you some data. And I'm going to tell you what the generation is actually like. Uh, we interviewed 11,000 young people in 10 countries, and it was a $4 million project. And then I, I'm very briefly going to talk about two of the issues that I raise in the book, how this changes management and how it changes marketing. There are many other topics that we can get into, how it changes learning in the university, how it changes democracy and government, how it changes uh, uh, society, and so on. But I'll just focus on those two today. And I want to leave time so that we can have a conversation. OK. If you're born between 1946 and 1965, you're part of the baby boom, biggest generation ever. Then the birth rate dropped off for a period of 12 years as the boomers delayed having kids, first generation to do that. And around 1978, the baby boomers started having children, the baby boom echo. And they produced this big generation. So demographers talk about the three post-war generations, the boom, the bust, sometimes called Gen X, and the echo, the echo of the boom. And you can see this in all kinds of data. This is school enrollment in the United States, boom, bust, and echo. But we don't get this yet. We talk about the aging of the population. I'm not sure that's a good term. The population is really bifurcated. We understood this. We know certain things, like why schools are in crisis. There's a huge wave of youngsters in the high schools and the universities. Now, that's going to starting to, to taper off right now. But um, over the past period, we have not understood this. We've said, yeah, the school's are in crisis. I know. What should we do? I don't know. Why don't we cut back on funding for education? Maybe that'll help. Um, 
you know, we don't get this yet. We, we call this generation the boomlet. It's not a boomlet. The echo, the gray part there, is um, 80 million people in the United States between the ages of 13 and 30. The eldest turned 31 this year. There are only 78.5 million baby boomers. So the echo is louder than the original boom, and based on their demographic muscle alone, this generation will dominate the 21st century. Now, let's give the generation a name. What do you want to call them? What's the defining characteristic of this generation? Well, some people have called them Gen Y, but to, to name them a, a letter that's a follow-on to the puny, demographically puny Generation X, that doesn't seem helpful. Some people call them the Millennials, but the fact that the year 2000 came and went didn't affect them. It's not a defining characteristic. You know what did affect them? This is the first generation <laughs> to come of age and the, to, to be bathed in bits. It's, it's the first generation of the digital age. I'm a digital immigrant. My kids are digital natives. This is the net generation. And you know something? Time online for these kids growing up is not taken away from hanging out with your friends, learning the piano, talking to your parents, doing your homework. Time online is taken away from television. The baby boomers, thank you, the baby boomers watched 24 hours a week of television, roughly, while they were growing up. This generation watches a lot less TV, and they watch it differently. They come home uh, from school, and they turn on their computer, and they're in three different windows, and they've got three magazines open, and they're listening to an MP3 file, and they're texting on the side, and they've got a video game going. Oh, yeah, they're doing their homework. <laughs> at the same time. The television may be going on in the background, but it's like music. It's like ambient media. And when they're online, what are they doing? Well, rather than being the passive recipients of somebody else's video, they're reading and organizing stuff and authenticating and scrutinizing and searching, doing research, uh, uh, telling their stories, uh, uh, collaborating, having to remember things. Even with video games, they're developing strategies. This is changing the way a generation thinks and processes information. Furthermore, this is the first time in human history when children are an authority about something really important in society. Think about that. When I was 11, I was an authority on model trains. Today, the 11-year-old at the breakfast table is an authority on this digital revolution that's changing business, commerce, government, learning, the university, entertainment, public, every institution in society. In the 60s, when I was a kid, there was a generation gap. Big differences between kids and, and their parents over values and lifestyle and ideas and so on. That doesn't exist so much today. Kids and parents get along pretty well. Those of you who've got teenagers, look at your iPod and, and your kid's iPod. There's overlap. My parents didn't even like the Beatles let alone the stone or the doors or something like that. What we have today is what I call the generation lap, where kids are lapping their parents on the info track. And if you have a teenager in your house, you know what I'm talking about. Who does the systems administration in your home? <laughs> so a word on brain science. And I'll begin with a big caveat. There's a lot that we don't know about the brain. Arguably, we've learned as much about the brain in the last seven years as we've learned in all time prior to that. But, and there's a lot of controversy around this. I have a point of view, having collaborated with the, the, the people who I thought were the most thoughtful brain scientists. There are critical, uh, two critical periods of brain development. Zero to three, it's not affected much by this. And the second is called extended adolescence. Eight, to 18. During these periods, after your DNA, the number one variable determining what your brain is like, the wiring of your brain, synaptic connections, is how you spend your time. And if you spend 24 hours a week, like the boomers did, being the passive recipient of video, you get a certain kind of brain. On the other hand, if you spend roughly an equivalent amount of time being the active handler, and 
uh, of information, the communicator, organizer, rememberer, that gives you a certain kind of brain as well. Now, I'm not talking about brain plasticity here. We all have brain plasticity. I was in London recently and I got in a, in a taxi and the guy says, where to, mate? And I said, uh, for Wifflepot Lane. It's this, something like that. it's this little block in the middle of nowhere. And he says, right, and off he goes. L MRIs on London taxi drivers show that that part of the, uh, the brain that's responsible for memory is bigger than regular people in London. So um, all of our brains can change, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the actual building of the brain that happens during this period of 8 to 18 years of age. So, I mean, I, I, I don't have time to go into it really now, but I'll, I'll just give you an example. Multitasking. I probably had hundreds of parents say to me, what's with this? The kids are doing like five things, including their homework. And uh, the, my first question is, how's your kid doing in school? And typically, they say, my kid does really well in school. So how can this be? Well, if, if you're working on an essay, uh, if you're doing something that requires deep thought, the research says it's best to eliminate the stimuli, uh, as many stim stimuli as you can. However, for a lot of activities, um, this generation seems to have what's called better active working memory and better switching abilities. So it looks like you're doing seven things at once. You're actually not. You're moving quickly between things. I can't even listen to music and read email at the same time, but my kids can. And the reason, I'm convinced, is because their brains are different. Now, the libraries and universities today are full of students. And kids naturally understand that I've got to get away from all this stuff if I'm going to work on, a, on something that requires deep thought. And you should uh, uh, do that. But that's one of just many issues. Now, we also asked them, uh, which would you rather be, smarter or better looking? And in every country except for one, um, <laughs> if you'd like an explanation for that, I'm not going there. I don't know if you can see in England they would rather be better looking. If you take away England, 80% of young people say they want to be smarter. So this whole thing about kids are vacuous and all they care about is shopping and how they, their appearance and so on, that's not supported by data. And then if they're the dumbest generation, well, our measure of intelligence is the IQ. And the IQ, of course, has been going up, not just during this generation, it's been going up for, for decades. So if we're talking about intelligence, they're the smartest generation, but it's a little more complicated than that. Um, if, look at something like SAT scores. SAT scores should have crashed because in 1978, it was only the smartest kids from the best schools that took an SAT. Now it's a mass phenomenon. So any of you know about research methodology, that should have dropped SAT scores significantly as more and more people uh, took it. It didn't do that. SAT scores have held their own or even gone up. So there is a real problem, though, and I'm going to be frank uh, uh, about it. In terms of the top third of the generation, they're spectacular. And you're in this room. You're the smartest generation ever. You're on, on every way that we can pretty much measure it. Uh, and, and there's a huge war for talent for you. Oh, the war for talent's over. There, there, there's a surplus of talent. No, there's, there's a surplus of labor. There's not a surplus of talent. And smart companies, I just did an executive briefing at, at FedEx, and one of the execs came up to me afterwards and he said, you know, one of the big insights of this briefing for me is that coming out of this recession, we don't want our company demographically to look like Italy. Now, I love Italy and food, people, wine, you know, what, whatever. But the population pyramid, old people to young people uh, of Italy. There, there are no young people in Italy. It's a big problem in many Western European countries. The worst is Japan, actually, that it has an old and aging society and a restrictive immigration policy. But um, so these kids are spectacular. There's no evidence that, stan I, that I can see that standards are declining. Uh, if anything, to get into the best schools, it's never been tougher and the requirements have never been greater. The middle third of the generation seems to be doing pretty well compared to previous generations. And if you look at the top graph, the bottom third are dropping out of school. 
So we have a real dichotomy here. There isn't one generation that's dumb or, or smart. We've got the top two thirds that are doing fine, and the bottom uh, third is failing. Now, according to Mark Bearline, it's because of the internet. It's uh, a dumbing out a generation. They're dumb and they're ignorant. He actually doesn't say, it. I've debated this guy multiple times, and he, he concedes that they're the most intelligent generation. He just says they don't know anything. Well, um, and the reason is because they're, they're all spending all their time on Facebook and Twitter, and the digital age is stupefying a generation. Well, how about an alternative explanation for why the bottom four, a uh, uh, bottom third of the generation, are not doing well? Teachers last 5.1 years because the conditions are so awful. They're underpaid. Class size of 30, 30, 40 people. They're teaching with an old model because when you have 30, 40 kids in the classroom, you can only use the broadcast model based on a lecture. I'm a teacher. I have knowledge. You're a student. You're an empty vessel. You don't. Get ready. Here it comes. Um, I've defined the lecture as the process whereby the notes of a lecture go to the notes of a student without going through the brains of either. <laughs> Now, I appreciate the irony that I'm up here giving a lecture, <laughs> but I'm going to say a lot of stuff. You, you, if you're lucky, you'll retain 5% of it or 10% of it. It's not a good way to learn. Um, how, about the, how about real problems like cultural problems, like um, urban districts? You know, a lot of these kids are coming from broken homes. The mom's working two jobs. She doesn't have time to talk to the kids, let alone work with the home. There are real problems. And to blame the internet is sort of like blaming the library for ignorance. The internet is not the problem here, it's part of the solution. Now how about all you overcoddled generations with your helicopter parents and uh, your sense of entitlement and so on? Well, the family has changed big time. This was the family, or the org chart of the baby boomer family um, <laughs> that I grew up in. Mom reported to dad, and the kids reported to mom, basically. And I, I was kid number one of five, which meant that the dog reported to me. Um, <laughs> this was enshrined in popular culture, father knows best. Well, today, um, you know, if, you're, this, if you have kids, this is a better org chart for your family. Are they overcoddled? Both of my kids moved in with us after they graduated. Uh, from university. Well, is that a bad thing? Kids graduate today, you got a huge debt. In many families, kids and parents get along great. You got a lot of freedom in the house. If your parents are smart, they'll do a deal with you like we did. We, had, we called it the social contract in the house. They had certain responsibilities. We love having them with us, and they love being with us, with us. Is that something bad? This is glass half full and glass half empty. They don't give a damn. Well, we've created a little army of narcissists, according to uh, Gene Twenge and Generation Me. Well, the only reason we care about narcissism is narcissists are only focused on themselves and they don't care about anybody else. Well, if that's true, how come volunteering in high school and university is at an all-time high? These kids have very strong values and civic action recently became political action. And uh, Obama understood that. And it was, a, it was a youth movement, I think, that propelled him to power. I'll defend that idea uh, if, if you'd like to hear about it. So there are some real problems. You have to be concerned about safety. Kids have to have balance. If your kid's you know, playing video games 50 hours a week, that's not good. Um, the schools are failing. Uh, we, we do have a digital divide still, although that's being closed in the world. It's a generational firewall, and we'll come to that. Biggest concern I have about the generation, actually, is privacy. Um, I'll speak to you young people. You're giving away too much personal information about yourselves. Uh, and I'm not going to ask you to put up your hand, but I will ask the question. You're on Facebook. Do you have the pro proper uh, profile set up? Do you have a limited profile? You've got your 15 best friends, and they're the only ones who should see you at that party, doing something that you're not going to want to have that picture 
uh, being part of your reference check later on in life. And there, are, there will be thousands of young people this year that won't get the dream job because they got all the way through and they failed the reference check. Because some employer found that they were drinking underage or swearing or doing, you know, something that you do when you're 18 but is not really you. And there's a potential destruction of everything that we've come to know as our basic right to privacy. Just because young people are an authority about something really important doesn't mean they're authorities about everything. And some things take experience to understand. So wh why do we have this situation? Well, I think it's about fear. And I'll, I'll just I'll tell you a quick story here and make the point. This is a panel. There was a big audience, the, I don't know, five, 6,000 people. And I interviewed these youngsters. This is the highest rated session of over 100 at this conference. And it was out of the mouths of babes, basically. This is a woman named Rahaf Harfouch. Um, she was 21 at the time. She was studying in Paris. Her boyfriend is in Toronto. They turn on video Skype all day long to keep their relationship going. I asked her, they cook across the Atlantic Ocean and stuff. I asked her, so you kids, your generation, do you use email? And she said, well, not really, uh, Mr. Tapscott. That's sort of like yesterday's technology. And I said, well, if you did use email, what would you use it for? She says, email. That's sort of like a formal technology, say for sending a thank you letter to one of your friend's parents. That would be a good use of email. Um, and one of the reasons the panel was received so well is I socked it to the kids, you know, about the stereotype. I said to Rahaf, aren't you the dumbest generation? You're ignorant, you don't know anything, you don't read the newspaper, you don't watch the TV news. Isn't it true you get your news from Jon Stewart in The Daily Show on Comedy Central? And she says, well, I don't think that's a fair stereotype. I think I'm informed, and everybody uh, I know, she, she says, putting it back to me, it's true, I don't read the newspaper, but Mr. Topscott, have you ever seen one of those things? Like, they come out once a day, and they don't have hot links, and they're not multimedia, and you get this weird black stuff on your fingers. It's a, she says, let me tell you about how I get the news. I have 60 RSS feeds, and I like to triangulate the news and get a different perspective on things. She says, I don't watch the television news, but does anybody? She, the average age of the nightly news is uh, 61 years of age. And she says, it's true, I watch The Daily Show, Jon Stewart, but not to get the news. I don't think The Daily Show is funny unless you know the news. So, um, I mean, this is Sherry Kong, 20 years old, one of 80 students hired by the government of New Zealand. Their job? to teach the teachers how to use the internet in the classroom. I asked her, so Sherry, what are the teachers like as students? She says, oh, Mr. Topscott, I have to tell you, they're awful. The teachers like they talk in class. They don't do their homework. Um, <laughs> she says, she's, I said, you ever give out a pink slip? She said, two last week. <laughs> and um, the granddaddy of Maul is uh, Michael Furtick. Uh, I've known Michael since he was 13 when he was the project manager on my website, uh, growingupdigital.com. They made him the project manager as a 13-year-old because he was the oldest and most experienced software engineer <laughs> on the team. Um, when Michael was 15, he sold his own site. It was getting 20 million page views a month. He sold it for an undisclosed seven or eight-figure sum. One of the news reports said it was only $1,000 or a million dollars. And, and I wrote him a note. I said, Michael, you sold it for a million dollars. You should have called me. And he wrote back and he said, Don, legally, I can't tell you how much I sold it for, but I can tell you I'm very happy. <laughs> and um, he didn't want the money to buy a Ferrari, although he bought a cheap little car, but his mom had to drive around with him because he only had his learner's permit. Um, <laughs> He wanted the money to invest in his next new venture. Some of you probably know about it. It's called takingitglobal.org or com. It's four million young people on a social network in 110 countries. Uh, uh, these are kids who want to change the world. So um, this is a generation that's defined by these eight norms. And it's the first ever global generation. These norms exist across the 10 countries that we studied. They want freedom, freedom of choice. Choice is like oxygen. When I was a kid, I had three media choices. Freedom of mobility. By the time they're 27, they're on their third job. They want to customize everything. I never got to customize the Mickey Mouse Club when I was a kid. Um, they're a generation of scrutinizers. They have great BS detectors, in part because there's so much BS on the internet. 
You know, I look at a woman on a magazine, Vogue or something, I see a model. My daughter sees something different. She sees, you know, a photograph that's been photoshopped where her cheekbones are bigger and her femur is longer and so on. Um, it, it's a generation of integrity, very strong values, a generation of collaborators in their culture is the new culture of work. Um, they want to have fun. They think work, learning, collaboration, and having fun are the same thing. We ask them, when you're online, what are you doing? Working, learning, collaborating, or having fun? And the, all the, the, the young people say, I can't answer the question. They say, yes. Those are all the same thing. You know what? They've got it right. Those of you who are working today in the workforce, what are you doing? Are you working or learning? It's knowledge work. It's, it's the same activity. Increasingly, we work and learn through collaboration, and hopefully you're having fun. I try and make my lectures fun because I find that people learn more when they're conscious. But um, <laughs> they want to have speed. Oh, immediate gratification. Well, I don't know. My daughter uh, was, uh, uh, when she graduated, was a consultant. She flew, commuted every week from Toronto to Minneapolis. And she could check into the Marriott Hotel there in 30 seconds. She wonders, why does it take 30 days to do something equally complicated from my federal government? Is that she wants immediate gratification, or do they have legitimate expectations that things should happen more quickly? And innovation and everything. So let me just say a couple of words about each of these, and then we'll, we'll throw it open. Uh, something's going on here, and you don't know what it is. So here's a youngster who decides, I'm not sure what I want to do, so I got 52 weeks in the next year, I'll have a different job, 52 jobs in 52 weeks. And while I'm at it, I'll ask each of my employers to make a contribution to a charity that I'm raising. Here's a, a, a grade six entrepreneur that did a $9 million Series A financing. When I was in grade six, I had a paper route. <laughs> the Wall Street Journal Lawyer of the Year turned out to be a student who was trolling the internet and participating in various legal discussion groups. And he was so brilliant that the journal chose him as the Lawyer of the Year, <laughs> even though he wasn't a lawyer. Hi there, my name is Ron Steen. I'm selling 2% of my future earnings for a chance to go to college. I'm offering up 2% of every dollar I make for the rest of my working life for a starting bid of $100,000. Um, <laughs> there's something different about. <laughs> so, you have this whole paradigm you recruit, you train, you supervise, and you retain. Um, I think that that paradigm of how we think about this is not just HR and human capital, this is how we think about management is going through a fundamental change right now. So um, we need to rethink a lot of this. We need to design work systems according to the eight norms. We need to rethink uh, authority and feedback. I had a youngster, <laughs> that it, it, and, and often you look at these kids in the workforce and you think, this is wacky. Uh, one youngster said to me, been working for me for three months, said, I want to talk to you, the CEO. I said, bring it on. She said, what's it going to take for me to be the CEO here? And one of the, you know, the bubble, I'm thinking, one of the things it will take is for me to get hit by a beer truck. But, um, <laughs> but it turns out she's enormously capable. And um, if I'd been able to retain her, which I couldn't, uh, she easily could have been the CEO of my company in a couple of years. Um, how about this one? Don. Give me some feedback on my presentation. I'm thinking, didn't we just talk about this three hours ago? You know, we have this view that, the, that you have your annual performance review. Well, what we found out in research, young people want feedback multiple times a day, not annually. So immediately we think, well, they, they want, they want, it, they want uh, uh, gratification. They have a pathological need for praise and so on. But you get underneath it, they're just trying to get better. So I discovered this great little software package called RIPPLE, R-Y-P-P-L-E, that enables you to have feedback multiple times a day. If I had um, people from my company in this audience, I would go back to my laptop when I logged on to uh, RIPPLE. There would be feedback from a dozen people anonymously. I solicited the feedback from them. And they'd tell me, well, your presentation was good. You made that point well. Not, you're not so good on that, and so on. 
listen to the children. In their culture is the new culture of work. Rethink training. If work and learning are the same thing, how can we have these big training departments? Why don't we try and increase the learning component of work? The training department in Engineering Insights is as follows. Everybody must blog. That's our training department. It increases the learning component of work. Don't ban Facebook. This is unbelievable. Kids, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, they got this great new collaborative culture. At their fingertips are more powerful tools than exist in our biggest corporations. They come into the workforce, what do we do? We stick them in a cubicle, treat them like Dilbert, and we ban their tools. We do the opposite of what we should do. I was talking to the CIO of a state where the governor had banned Facebook. I said, why did, why did he do that? He said, well, he thought young people are wasting their time online and um, during the day. And I said, well, is that a technology problem? Isn't that a management problem? It has to do with uh, job design and workflow and supervision and, and performance evaluation? I said, what was the effect of banning Facebook? He said, well, everybody went to MySpace. <laughs> Another youngster I asked, what was the effect of banning Facebook? He said it was the single most demoralizing thing management has ever done. It said to us, we don't get your tools, we don't get collaboration, we don't understand your generation, and we don't trust you. Rethink retention. You can't retain people like you retain fluids or something like that. You know? There are all kinds of new models, and, and we talk about, uh, about this in the book of building alumni networks. Talent doesn't need to be inside your boundaries anymore. And we've created a generational firewall. You know, sure, young people, it's the first time ever we can learn from them, but they need to learn a lot from older people too. So what's happening is there's a huge clash that's shaping up, I think, in the workforce. And uh, this is a real shame. Because when you bring these two generations together, great stuff happens. I have three formal two-way mentoring programs with youngsters in their early 20s. And every uh, week, we have a conversation. And they tell me about all the cool new stuff. They forced me to get onto Twitter. And, um, and I said, Are you, you've got to be kidding. 140 characters? This is ridiculous. So, but they, they said, you've got to try it. So I tried it out. Now, of course, I'm on Twitter. And uh, microblogging is part of these new collaborative platforms that are part of the new, they're creating a new operating system uh, for the corporation, basically, moving us to a real-time model of the corporation. There's so much that we can learn from each other. Final thought, um, I think, <laughs> and I, I'm provo provoking you here too, uh, most of what we know about marketing is wrong. Um, why? Well, first of all, the new web is a platform for collaboration. It's not about websites. I could show you 50 charts. Everyone shows the old HTML website being eclipsed by the XML-based community. I've actually banned the term website to, to the extent that I can ban things in our company. It's such a dot-com idea. You don't want to create a website. Con MTV says, we have better content. We hope you have better content. YouTube says, no, we can create a context where I use self organization create your own content. So opinions beats consumer reports, and Facebook beats Match.com, and Wikipedia beats, oh, this is hardly fair. Um, those of you at the back of the room, there is a little red line <laughs> along the bottom here. Um, I don't have time to tell this story. But basically, um, when I gave my son Alex, who was a junior in college, an advanced copy of a book I'd written called Wikonomics, uh, it was uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, he said, I think I'll create a community on Facebook. And by the time we're eating turkey on Christmas night, he's got 130 members in seven countries, a president, secretary, chief information officer. He sent out a PDF of the first two chapters of the book. I got kids writing back in saying, uh, Mr. Topscott, we found errors in your book. And um, the community is placing demands on me. <laughs> How exactly will Mr. Topscott be contributing to our community? This is called keyword, self-organization. Self-organization has been around for history. No central committee said this will be called a watch. It just happened. For example, language 
was a function of self-organization. But what used to take place over millennia or years can now happen very quickly on a single Christmas day. I never could have done this in, in, in months. When I was a junior at college, Alex did it on a single day. So we don't, you, you shouldn't market to, pe to individuals anymore. Because they have this, we have these things, I call them influence networks. You got your 15 best friends, your social network, and the rest of the world. And each of those are enormously influential. What do we do? We do the opposite. In all of our institutions, we do the opposite of what we should be doing. I mean, the, the consumer time spent online is skyrocketing. The advertising dollars, the gap is getting bigger. We, Procter & Gamble spends seven billion dollars a year, most of that on television advertising. Most of the marketing dollar is wasted on the largest and most influential generation ever. You know that old saw, half of my ads work, I just don't know which half? I'm prepared to guarantee the 65% of ads that they bleep out by time shifting using a TiVo or PVR by watching television on a computer. That 65% of ads they never see, those ones don't work. I'll guarantee that. So why do we keep doing this? Um, and these influence networks are enormously influential. So rather than products, build experiences. And those eight norms have to be part of that. You know, 60% of them say having fun with a product or service is as important as what the product or service does. We've got. Uh, over 50% of any significant purchase, the young person in the United States knows what they're going to buy before they go to the store. So the place is becoming a lot less important. Um, new price discovery mechanisms, because people have power. So the idea that sellers establish prices, that one's going away and will go away. Rather than promotion, we need to engage people and the brand is no longer an image, a word in the mind, a promise. The brand is becoming a much more complicated concept. Is at the foundation of the brand. Things don't go better with Coke if Coke is being accused of having an unauthentic viral marketing campaign around Coke Zero, where they create the Coke Zero movement, they just don't mention to anyone that they're behind it. So now the Coke Zero movement is highly discredited with with young people. You, you, you Google that and one of the first things that comes up is a place where you can buy t-shirts. I joined the Coke Zero movement and all I got was this lousy brain tumor. Now, Coke Zero is a great product. I love it, actually. But the brand has been deeply hurt because they didn't understand the new paradigm in marketing. So rather than the four Ps, we have a, the C, A, D, E, and Bs of marketing. Of course, if you reorganize those, I'm a consultant. I can't restrain myself. Um, we get a new paradigm in marketing. So don't focus on your customers. Engage them. Uh, don't create better products and services. Create experiences. Radically reduce advertising and broadcast media. Plug into influence networks. Rethink the brand. Bake integrity into your corporate uh, DNA. And um, we need to get away from the, the four Ps of marketing. If you understand this generation as consumers, you'll know how marketing is changing overall. So those are three points. Um, this is a new paradigm I'm describing, a new mental model of a whole bunch of things. And when you get one of these, you get a crisis of leadership. Vested interests fight against change. And leaders of old paradigms have great difficulty embracing the new. And I think that that's behind a lot of the fear and cynicism that exists. A final factoid. Um, some of you are on Twitter, no doubt. Please don't tweet this, OK? This guy, Mark Berline, I'm, I debate this guy. And um, I'm going to use this in one of these debates. It's going to go like this. Mark, let's define smart and dumb. Smart would be, whoops, let's start with dumb. Dumb would be. You write a book called The Dumbest Generation, and you don't go out and buy the URL. <laughs> Smart would be like the 20-year-old in my office heard that I was debating this guy, wondered, did he get the URL for his book? Found it online, paid $50, gave it to me. And now when you go to thedumbestgeneration.com, <laughs> 
you go to a site that I'm hosting that recommends you get involved in a much deeper community <laughs> and that suggests that you should, in fact, buy a book. <laughs> So why don't we uh, why don't we have a, a conversation?